Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the show. It's earnings week. Lots of news coming out. It's going to be a crazy one. Let's go. All right, everybody. Good morning. Hope you had a good weekend. Let's get back at it. So it's earnings week. And this is when we're first of all, starting tomorrow, we're going to start to see what the big banks do. So what I'm going to do for the next couple, maybe two to three weeks is I want to pull up earnings every morning. I use stock twits. And I just like how stock twits does it because they tell me exactly what earnings are happening that day. And more importantly, if they're before or after the bell. So they break it down very well. And of course, we have the big banks starting tomorrow. JP Morgan's kicking that off. So it's going to be interesting to see what's happening. Of course, we saw with um, Wells Fargo last week, they said they were going to stop giving out their lines of credit. And to existing customers with lines of credit, they're going to take them away from them in 60 days. So I don't necessarily think somebody was talking about Wells Fargo this morning in the Bid and Ask Nation. I don't think that we're going to see the effects of taking that away, that 24, $25 billion, whatever it was, of lines of credit this quarter. I think we'll start seeing that next quarter. But what's going to be important this quarter is what do, what we're going to see with the banks, and that is going to dictate what the Fed is going to do as far as starting to trim uh, quantitative easing and going after the interest rates that they have, how, how much longer they're going to go. Goldman Sachs also reports tomorrow. Let's look ahead at Wednesday. Bank of America, Wells Fargo. BlackRock, Citigroup, uh, Delta is snuck in there. Let's see what we got. I thought I saw another bank. Morgan Stanley reports Thursday. Bank of New York, Mellon reports Thursday. U.S. Bank, and let's see what's on Friday. Friday, Charles Schwab. And then next week, you're going to start to really get into the companies that you guys follow. So remember, if you are in a stock and you are trading it, not in, not investing from a value side, if you're trading it, be very careful going into earnings because earnings are a total crapshoot. You could have the best earnings in the world and that stock can drop 15% on you because of forward guidance from some bozo analyst out there or something. So 
just be careful with that. And let's see what the markets are doing today. Smash the like button for me as we get started. Futures down a touch. Of course, NASDAQ's up. When is the NASDAQ not up? Everybody just, the NASDAQ just never just stops going up. But um, let's see here. Let's see here. I want to start with the outlook for the week, which is basically the earnings. What, what's to be expected this season? So, of course, it's second quarter is kicking off. The S&P 500 earnings in aggregate are expected to grow 64% for the second quarter, which would mark the fastest increase since the fourth quarter of 2009, according to FactSet. Now, that's great and all, but we have to remember, just like for the 2009 fourth quarter, we were coming out of, well, we weren't coming, we, it's, we were beginning to start the recovery of the financial crisis, what have you. So this is the, kind of the same thing. It, with with these kind of gains, you have to look at it and put it in perspective to why we had that kind of rapid growth. Now, is that good because we uh, came out of financial crisis? Yeah, but I still think that we're going to face a lot of supply issues, which are going to strangle um, businesses, sales, et cetera, retail sales, etc. So let's go down here. I just took a, a couple of poll quotes. As usual, the big banks will be the first to report. Quarterly results expectations are ex exceptionally high for the financial sector, which has come in at the third best performing in the uh, S&P 500 out of the 11 sectors this far year to date, topped only by energy and, of course, real estate, because that doesn't stop going up. As, and as Wall Street has uh, struck an increasingly more upbeat tone on earnings potential for this sector overall in the past several months, upwardly revising consensus outlook on company earnings. The financial sector has recorded its third largest percentage increase in estimated dollar value earnings for all of the uh, 11 sectors. Look at this number. Um, at the start of the quarter, 11.5%, 69.8 billion from 62.7 billion. So the benchmark, this is another thing that you guys know that I've been keeping my eye on. And it's the benchmark for the 10-year treasury yield. I'll pull that up a little bit later. It ticked up a little bit on Friday. Remember, we were down at 1.25% uh, intraday on the, on. well, I guess it's always moving, but intra intra-market day. I think that was on Wednesday. Maybe it was on Thursday, but that was getting relatively low. We know that that three month is creeping up and, I, and I've talked about yield inversion several times. If we start getting yields inverting or flattening, look out. It's gonna get, it's gonna get rough out there. The, Mark my words and don't doubt me on this one. The Fed will come to the rescue. Daddy's coming to the rescue. Every single time there is a yield curve inversion in the past 15 years, daddy comes to the rescue. Um, another big thing that's coming out this week is the Consumer Pricing Index from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They're expecting to see an uptick, which is going to give some kind of insight to the inflation. Remember, the food and energy prices are excluded from that. So I don't understand how or why that is. It's probably to keep, it's probably to, it's probably to do something to tailor the, the panic. I mean, it's always been that way. It's nothing new, but it's, um, it, it's going to be, uh, as far as inflation goes, I think we need to look at that stuff. Air pad, let's see, prices of sector, yeah, CPI, 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 CPI. Based on an internal data, June marked the third month where durable goods spending was a drag to the overall spending while services get a boost. So I think we're going to start seeing services come back, like I have told you, in September time. And the only reason for that is as these states start to cut their additional COVID benefits, People are going to start going back to work. I, I talked to a business owner on Friday. He said in the state of Ohio, they are already seeing, I think they got rid of it on June 29th. They, <clears throat> excuse me, they're already seeing an uptick in um, applica job applications. It's small, but it's happening. And that is exactly what's going to happen. If 20, I think, believe 24 states have done it. You're going to start to see it in September is when I think you're going to start seeing the labor numbers truly go up. So Tuesday, tomorrow, CPI number, Wednesday, mortgage applications, Thursday, of course, continuing jobless claims, and then Friday, we get the retail sales month over month. So this is going to be an interesting week. Um, just keep your eyes open, earnings, there's just a lot of news coming out. Let's do inflation next. 
Higher inflation isn't going away, contrary to what Jerome Powell wants to tell you. And I do agree with what this person is saying. The biggest surge in U.S. inflation is more than in more than a decade was supposed to start petering out over the summer, but it looks like the bout of higher prices is gonna, is going to continue to last. If Wall Street's forecast is spot on, that would keep the increase in cost of living over the past year at an at or near a 13 year high of 5%. And I do believe that's going to keep happening. And, and it really comes down to a simple thing. I just think it's a supply issue. It ranges from, I mean, we did the story on Friday last week about OPEC. We did the story about, um, we do the story about lumber. We do the story about housing. We do all these stories about whatnot. And it all comes down to one thing and it all comes down to supply issues. So if you have supply issues, it's going to be tough. Businesses, for their part, are struggling to keep up with demand because they can't get enough supplies. Just like I said, rail. Hey, if, are there any people that were in the in in the on the show right now that work in the trucking industry or the railroad industry? I'm curious to know what it's like for you guys. I've it says railroads are backed up. Even truck drivers are hard to find. I really haven't paid attention to the amount of trucks on the road. If it's more or less, but if you're in the trucking industry, I know we've had a couple guys on here before that are saying it. Um, let me know how it is for the trucking industry, because that the transports are a big one. You can pull up an S and P ETF and look at the transports, look at the materials that are being transported and say that, do we have a lot of, um, are we having any issues? And, and those are very telling. So the fed acknowledged that supply disruptions and labor shortages might linger for longer and, uh, might have larger or more persistent effects on prices and wages than they currently assume. Well, that's good. Most importantly, the Fed predicts supply disruptions will go away by uh, next year and the United States and global economies will return to normal. I guess we'll find out. In the worst case scenario, inflation would remain well above the Fed's 2% target, say 2.5 to 3%. That's their target. I think healthy inflation is 3 to 3.5%. I don't know what's necessarily wrong with that unless it gets there too quickly. But... Um, if we're thinking long term, I, I have to believe that this is just talking about by the end of this year. If that turned out to be the case, if this turned out to be the case by the end of this year, the central banks might have to raise interest rates more quickly and to higher levels than the Fed now thinks will be necessary. Such an outcome could short circuit the economic recovery. It would short circuit everybody's brain in the market and we would just be a it would just be a disaster. That's exactly what would happen. <laughs> trucking isn't here's a comment from Cash. Trucking is an issue for me, but I have but I always have no, uh, I always have issues and no one wants to come to Northern Ontario. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Interesting story here. The headline got me. And then as I started reading down, I was like, oh, okay. I can kind of see why, um, why this is the case. They point, they made some interesting points true or not, but it, it's a good one. So a record low share of Americans income is going to pay off debt. As you drive down to downtown Cleveland, from where I live, there's a sign on the left side of the highway that says the average debt per person in the United States. And I don't really drive downtown that much, but I drove down on Saturday and it said 82, 82,000 plus per person in the United States. That was pretty incredible. So here we go. A measure of how much Americans income goes towards debt hit a 40 year low during the pandemic. In the first quarter of 2021, Americans used 8.2% of their monthly disposable income for debts significantly lower than the 9.8% recorded in the first quarter of 2020. Of course, that was pre pandemic. This is extremely unusual in a recession says this uh, senior fellow, uh, the Jane Family Institute and former Federal Reserve economist. Let's get down to here. First, Americans got a big boost in their disposable income during the pandemic, mostly driven by government transfers, including stimulus payments and enhanced unemployment benefits that helped lower the ratio. Disposable income has reached its highest level on uh, on record of twenty two trillion dollars by March of 2021. Let's see here. The ratio fell notably to a very low level. Sam said, but it fell very low level for the first quarter of this year, largely reflecting a jump in income due to stimulus checks. Americans did not pile on more debt during the pandemic. So that was his first, that was their first factor of not paying down debt. The second factor for the first quarter decline in household debt service, that, that was the first, okay. 
Debt levels have consistently increased over the years, especially during recessions, but the pandemic was an exception. During the crisis, the amount of debt service that people, um, that, uh, hold on, the amount of debt service that people had stayed pretty flat, which was not the case in the Great Recession. For instance, collective credit card loans or balances were 11% lower on June 23rd versus March of 2020. So his point is basically, people weren't taking out any debt any more debt. And really it was different this time. I mean, we say that, but it was different this time. You were stuck in your house and what were you to do? You're piling cash. I mean, it, it makes sense. As I kept reading down the article, it made sense. Of course, lower in people were refinancing, lower interest rates, etc. So this was a very, very interesting article. The, per the writer made great points about it, of why we were sitting at these levels. So um, we are going to see what's going to happen into the future, but it, it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, the, the problem is the debt number is definitely increasing and we, people got to pay down their debt an average of 82,000 plus per person. That is a lot of freaking debt and that's per person that, that, and then we, and then we have it moving in with what the government has in debt and boof, there's just a lot of debt out there. This article Seth sent to me this morning, mortgage services. Brace for fallout as COVID bailout comes to an end. So a lot of the mortgage companies, uh, Fre Freddie and Fannie and some private ones also, they said at the, during the, during the pandemic, they froze your mortgage payments. They let you go on to not pay them. So now it is coming down to the time where people need to start paying their mortgages again after the stay. So the national mortgage nation's mortgage services are gearing up for the biggest wave of delinquent loans since the subprime mortgage crisis. The first wave of borrowers to enter the government's coronavirus mortgage bailout program are entering their last possible quarter for relief, which means that come September, they will either have to start paying, sell their homes or be foreclosed on an estimated 7.25 million borrowers had participated in the forbearance program at one point or another representing 14% of all homeowners with mortgages. Now, about 72% of all participants have since left their plan. So that's great. I mean, people, that number, that number tells me right now that it is with 72% already leaving willingly, just not being forced off of it. I think everything's going to be okay. There's going to be, of course, there's going to be delinquencies and, and such. I mean, it, it's the reality of the situation, but there's a good possibility that those delinquent mortgages would have been delinquent with or without this uh, situation being being there. So we talked about this. I don't know if we put out the Tesla video this weekend or not. Maybe one. I, oh, yeah, we did. We put out the Tesla video this weekend and we talked about this Solar City deal, which was with um, um, Elon Musk cousins, two cousins. They own the company and he bought it or something. So Elon Musk is under fire again, the CEO to testify over Tesla's acquisition of Solar City. Now, I remember when Solar City, the Solar City deal happened. It was God's gift to Earth. All the type dorks thought this was the greatest thing in the whole world. Solar City, Solar City. And now all of the hype dorks are saying, well, we knew this wasn't going to work. And this it's very unsurprising that this this didn't work and this and that. Grow up. In the run-up of Tesla's two, uh, 2016 acquisition of the company called Solar City. Elon Musk hailed the deal as a no-brainer. And he's he's still standing by that. Not surprising he's, that he's still standing by that, but he is. On Monday, in a Delaware court, the Tesla CEO will testify about the $2.5 billion deal in, shareholder, in a shareholder lawsuit that alleges that Tesla's acquisition was rife with conflicts and interest. It overlooked SolarCity's fundamental weakness and unsurprisingly failed to produce the profits Musk had promised. Unsurprisingly failed, yeah. But back uh, back in the day when this happened, Solar City was the greatest thing since sliced bread, and you couldn't find a person out there that didn't think that this was the best. This is great proof. We put out that video in 2000, of, we put out that video over the weekend about what happened in 2008 with all of those news anchors from CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, et cetera, saying that, the markets were wonderful and this and that, and they can't fall and blah, blah, blah. This is exactly it's the same thing on a smaller scale. Solar City had been founded by Musk and by two of his cousins. In late August, 
A judge approved a $60 million settlement that resolved the claims made against all of the directors on Tesla's board, except for Musk, without any admission of fault. That left Musk, who refused to settle, <laughs> the sole remaining defendant. This guy's incredible. <laughs> this guy's just incredible. Um, this is a, I highlighted this part because it's funny. I've suggested that while any such payment wouldn't seriously affect Elon Musk's wealth, it would damage his reputation for choosing acquisitions. I don't believe that. I don't believe that one bit. The, the guy, the guy is, he's, he's, he's Teflon. No. Musk is fighting. Everybody, we, we still, did everybody forget about the, um, when he said, I'm taking Tesla public or private at 420? That, that should have probably damaged his reputation too when he got removed as CEO or removed from the board or whatever, whatever happened, president of the board, whatever happened. Um, I don't see that damaging his reputation. This ain't going to damage his reputation. Musk is fighting the lawsuits after others have settled because that's what Musk does. I believe Elon believes that this was the right deal and still does. And I actually do believe that too. So, all right, let's go to Apple. Everyone's talking about Apple. Has Apple peaked? This kind of came at it from a technical standpoint. All right. Apple is so Apple is just overbought um, like it was in September. And he's going in and he's looking at this stochastic RSI. It is hitting all-time highs. Oh, we'll pull up the chart and take a look at this when we get going. But I just wanted to point this out to you guys. 45 analysts on Wall Street who cover Apple say that 76% of them say it's a buy. So take it for what it's worth. We'll pull up Apple in a second. All right. Back when Biogen came out, I said to you, write this down. And I don't remember what the date was, but I told you, write this down. Remember who said this? I said in 12 to 18 months, don't be surprised if Biogen's drug aticunumab for Alzheimer's gets pulled. Now, the FDA calls for an investigation into its own approval of Biogen's Alzheimer's drug. Don't forget the three board members of the FDA that sat on the approval of Biogen have since left. Um... There are not people, there are not that many people using the drug because it's too expensive for what the um, efficacy is. The acting commissioner of the FDA has called for a government investigation into her own agency's approval of Biogen's Alzheimer's drug. There continue to be concerns raised, however, regarding contracts between representatives from Biogen and the FDA during the review process, including some that may have occurred outside of the formal correspondence and process. Back in November, this is back in November, an independent advisory committee voted largely against the effectiveness of aticunumab based on the clinical trial data that was made available as part of Biogen's application. This drug is not, there's a lot to say about this drug. If you guys, you know what, if you guys want to really get into pharma and start reading some interesting stuff, start reading about this drug. Just read all kinds of different things. It's it's very interesting. There's, there's two sides of the story. There's two beliefs on everything, but it's very interesting to see what's going on. Several members of the committee quit in response to the approval. The Atacuna, This is from um, one of the board members that quit. The Atacunamab decision is the worst example yet of the FDA's movement away from its high, very high standards. Totally agree. So Keep an eye on what's going to happen with Biogen over the coming weeks to months. And remember where you heard it first. Remember where you heard it first. Let's, let's peek at futures one more time. Okay, they're coming back a little bit. This this Dow the Dow is down almost two hundred points uh, earlier in the day, earlier in the morning. I mean, let's see what we got here with the yield curve. Ten years popping a little bit, but so is the three month. The three this three month. This is the highest it's been since I can't remember. This has been, it's it's not that high, but the creep, starting to creep, starting to creep. All right, let's see here. Earnings, we already did. Patreon.com slash everything money. We actually added something overnight. So if you want to join our Discord chat, $7 a month will get you into the Discord. It's great. If you want the Discord and all of our software, our software is incredible, 25 bucks a month. Um, gets you in there, gets you access to the discord, gets you certain things once a month with me and Paul and Seth gets you discounts to other businesses. We have, if you want to be in the bid and ask nation, this is where you learn to trade. This is where you get exclusive access to me, exclusive access to different, different chats in the discord, etc. 
Um, $69 a month right now. That's what, that's what it'll get you. And guys, this number is going to keep going up. This number was $68 last night. This was $24 last night. So if you want to do a, a private session with Paul, if you're buying a real estate deal, 10 G's will get you that. And to me, it's worth it. Totally worth it. He, he knows what he's talking about. This is the new one. If you want to do a one-on-one -on -one trading session with me, talk to me, whatever, whatever, about, talk to me about whatever you want to talk about. If you're the basic beginner or you want to clear up some things that you really want to do, um, get into the nitty gritty of it, let me know. $500 one-time fee, one hour Zoom call with me and we'll do it. I've done it with a couple of people already. Um, they're pretty good traders right now. So let me know what you want to do. But let's take a look at some stocks. Send me a few. I want to look at Cardinal Health because it is starting to do a little bit of a sweet spot reversal. And this is the big thing. It's just stuck at three major moving averages right here. Can't get through it. Once it gets through, you can look at this. Look at this. See how there's that long wick right there? That means that the price moved up, literally touched that blue line, which is the 100 day moving average and came right back down. So it's just struggling to get through the 100 day moving average. The volume is pretty lackluster. We need, if it gets three days of volume, just like that, see uh, Cardinal Health will break through. That's for sure. Um, ah, yeah, so um, I went to a uh, convention in Tampa last weekend for, uh, it was about crypto. So that was pretty sick. Uh, new crypto prediction. I think we're going to get to 500,000 on Bitcoin by the end of this year. Um, so that's my newest, there's some really good speakers at the, at the, at the convention and whatnot, but man, was Tampa hot, Whew, humid as can be. So 500,000 by the end of this year, it's going to, it's going to rebound and buy the dip. I'm just joking. Sarcasm for those of you that don't know. All right. Let's see Intel. Intel, Intel. <laughs> Mo is now a Bitcoin, Bitcoin bull. <laughs> All right. Let's see. So I like what this is doing. I love, I love that we're coming through the sweet spot like this, but you can see it's just stuck between two moving averages, the 200 day moving average and the 50 day moving average. So the, what I really like about this is that we need to fill the gap. We need to fill the gap and this gap will definitely fill. So it's just a matter of time before it fills, but we're going to need to uh, fill the gap. All right. Let's see here. Let's see here. BJ's wholesale. I think you want to look at, let's see what BJ's doing. So man, BJ's all right. So it's doing all right. Let's see what would happen here. So we actually bought this thing. When did we buy this? We bought this right in here. Uh, was it? I don't remember. It, it was somewhere in here. I think it was No, I don't know. Regardless of when we bought it, everything was looking really, really good. And then unfortunately the CEO had passed away and the CEO is very young and it was just a freak. I, I don't actually know what happened with it, but regardless, the trade just went really badly on us. We recuper we recuperated our money. We made a little bit of profit on it, but now, um, so they're doing a sweet spot reversal right now. If I'm you, I'm waiting until it breaks out over this level. What is that? 49, call it $49. If you can get over $49, go for it. But uh, just be patient with this one. Man, that, that trade went again against us pretty badly. All right, TGTX. Uh, smash the like button for me, guys. We're almost at 100. Get it there. Get it there. What's still undervalued to you? Eh, okay, I don't know. He's probably talking about Intel. All right, TGTX. I don't know what this is. I've never heard of it. I've never heard of it. I would want to look into, well, you're looking at it from a trading point of view, so whatever. 200 day moving average and 100 day moving average is just stuck right there. Let's see what, 45 bucks. Yeah, you can give this a run. I would probably trade this over here to be honest with you. I would trade that from a swing trading perspective, not from a long term, because I think once it hits that 100 day moving average, it's gonna bounce just because there's very little volume in the market and that's going to, that's going to crush you. All right, let's see next HPQ. You know, you're, you're, I, I'm assuming you're looking at this from a long-term perspective. I just don't, you got to wait till this thing gets in the sweet spot. Let it get up here in, in the, between 32 and 80% on the long-term stochastic. I think that'll be right around here probably $30 and 70 cents or so, but 
man, yeah, it's a, t- it's a tough stock. Be patient with that one. Not ideal. Not ideal in any way. Discovery. Man, Discovery is just getting smoked. This was the Archegos. This is when that family office got margin called with $35 billion. Let's see what we got. Let's zoom in here and just see what we got going. So you're just going sideways on the bottom. Stock price tried. To, I mean, it's it's trying, but look at this is a disaster. The volume is terrible. Just stay away. If you want to day trade it, maybe you'll get some volatility out of it. But I wouldn't do anything besides that. Walgreens. Let's do Walgreens. I like Walgreens. I like Walgreens from a value perspective, personally. So Walgreens is holding there. I do not think they're going to fall below this level. Ha, that's funny. That's a 200 day moving average. So you can see how powerful moving averages are. It just held right at that 200 day moving average. So don't bet on this thing to drop any further. I would, I think it's going to hold right around here. If anything, I think it could drop to this $46, but it won't, I don't think it'll drop much lower unless something catastrophic happens, but, uh, definitely keep an eye on Walgreens. From a trading perspective, you got to be patient. But from a value perspective, I'd take a look. I've been looking at options on them for sure. I really love the, op- well, the options suck on them. There's there's no there's no doubt about that. But um, the premium is terrible. But all right, let's, I'll look at, uh, I'll look at Citigroup after this, just because it's a big bank. All right, let's see here, guys. Lemonade, I don't know what this is. Isn't Lemonade the little payment company where you, or was that Acorn? I don't know. Oh, this is a newer company. When did they go public? June. Hmm. Not impressed. I think if you want to do something with this, this is one of those IPOs. Wait, 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 wait. Did they go? Nope. You're good. You're fine. You're fine. I I was looking at the wrong date. I was going to say, it looks like a lot of charts. So you're fine with this. Um, to, to be honest with you, I would look to short this thing. And I think you'll probably get to this $83 level on a short. So looking good from a shorting perspective, not a long-term perspective. All right, let's look at Citigroup. The market is open now. Citigroup. So be careful when you do these banks this week, just because we, we they're going to be everywhere. And if they have good earnings, especially because they've dropped below this 100-day moving average, all the banks have they could pop this thing right back up here. Let's just uh, let's just run through the banks. Let's do Bank of America. See, it's sitting right at its 100-day moving average, deciding where to go. Let's do Goldman. Uh, what's 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 Goldman Sachs's ticker? Goldman. I haven't looked at Goldman Sachs in forever. Oh yeah, GS. All right. Uh, let's see. They're sitting. Oh, they're above their 100-day moving average. Let's look at Wells Fargo sitting right at their 100-day moving average. So banks all, all pretty much do the same thing. And if we actually look at XL, I think it's XLK, no, XLB. XLB would make more sense. Nope. Let me uh, just let me just pull up the bank sector for you real quick. Just so we can, oh, XLE, isn't it? No, it's energy. I can't remember. I haven't looked at these things in so damn long. Anyways, if you, XLF, that's the financial sector. So let's see, and there you go. It's sitting right right above its 100-day moving average. So if you, pretty much, if you look at all the banks and you look at XLF, which is the bank ETF for the S&P, that's what you're going to find. They're all going to look the same. So be very careful with these banks this week. Let everything settle down um, and go from there. So that's it for today, guys. You guys have a wonderful day. Be careful trading banks. Be conscious of your earnings. Please use stock twits. They, they use a, they use, they have a great, um, Great earnings calendar tells you who's reporting and if it's before or after the bell. So you guys have a good one. I will see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We'll do it all over. Peace.
Thank <laughs> you.